Participants, thank you so much for joining. We're gonna go ahead and get started, although uh, some more will likely trickle in. Uh, my name is Jenny and uh, I work with and Engage Alliance Global Secretariat and I'm supporting today just with the introductory facilitation uh, for this wonderful session, no interventions with men during COVID-19, the impact on male participants, communities, and women coordinators. I'm just going to lead you quickly through a few slides uh, regarding technical considerations for your support uh, as the session is introduced. So we do have translation. Um, of course, we have a colleague today speaking in Spanish and a few of our colleagues speaking in English. So uh, in order to facilitate a smooth um, uh, listening no? <laughs> of, the, of the session, please choose your preferred language. You have to click on the globe um, and then pick the language that uh, you want to be translated into and it will provide a smooth transition throughout our speakers changing languages. Please remain muted throughout the course of the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please go ahead and type them in the chat box. And if you would be so kind as to edit your name, if you click on the participant list, uh, you can very easily uh, rename yourself. Uh, and it shows a little picture here on how to do so. Um, we appreciate that, thank you so much. Um, of course, you can use emojis uh, if you feel like anything that was shared was exciting. And then just to let you know, we are recording the session. Um, just another reminder, this is the icon where you can click uh, in order to enable your translation. We have uh, our great colleagues here, Lauda and Hazel. Uh, to both of you, thank you so much for joining us to support with the translation. They will be helping us uh, to do so throughout the course of the session. Um, there's also the ability to uh, translate through Wordly uh, into 17 different languages. If you go to the very top left corner, um, we're going to enable this right now for live custom streaming. Uh, you would just click on that and then um, click on view stream and custom and Wordly will open up, which will enable you to translate uh, to many different languages. So please look out for that. Wordly is gonna pop up as a side screen. So feel free to minimize it and put it on the side of your screen so you can view both the presentation and Wordly's translation. Uh, these are all the languages that Wordly translates and two, so just take a look if any of those might be of interest to you. Wonderful, and I see a few more guests have arrived. Welcome. Um, and I think uh, if we're ready, I'll just begin by introducing our speakers and then uh, passing it over to them. Uh, one moment. Great, and so, to begin with, uh, we're going to hear a presentation from uh, Maria Beatriz uh, Cositorti. Uh, she's a teacher, a social psychologist, a coordinator of assistance groups for men who exert violence uh, and their effective relationships, a uh, community mediator, a trainer, and a member of the Decidir Civil Society Association. Um, and with that, I pass it over to uh, Maria Beatriz, and I'll be sharing your presentation right now. Bueno, muchas gracias. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos, bienvenides. Eh, como bien eh, estaban relatando, eh, en primer lugar, quería eh, agradecer la oportunidad de este momento, de este encuentro. Y me permití pensar en función de la forma de convocatoria. Eh, desde hace un tiempo vengo investigando de manera exploratoria qué nos ocurre a nosotras, las mujeres, nosotras, las otras, las mujeres que ejercemos este lugar profesional, justamente en una problemática tan compleja como es la violencia por razones de género. Me presento yo eh, soy de la República Argentina, 
de la provincia de Buenos Aires, de un distrito eh, de Moreno, que nosotros le decimos aquí en Argentina del Conurbano, 30 kilómetros de la ciudad, que recurre donde tienen todas las instituciones eh, corporativas, judiciales, de todo el país. Eh, soy miembro de la Asociación Civil Decidir, es una ONG que aquí en este territorio eh, de Moreno está eh, ubicada desde hace 20 años y justamente se especializa en trabajar con estas temáticas que tienen que ver con la violencia hacia las mujeres, con eh, dispositivos grupales, fue una de las eh, ONGs pioneras en el trabajo con grupalidades pensando en, justamente, trabajando con los varones, pensando en las mujeres, trabajando en la temática del colectivo de las disidencias, eh, tratando de llegar hacia eh, toda la población. Eh, a la vez pertenezco a, soy miembro de la red RETEN, que es una red de equipos y trabajos e investigación en masculinidades, que está radicada en el país y que distintas eh, organizaciones, instituciones de bien públicos, eh, pertenecemos de diferentes provincias a esta red que se creó de la convocatoria del licenciado Mario Payarola en octubre del 2011. Bueno, tomé esta frase para comenzar sobre eh, John Scott, una historiadora eh, que investiga y que trabaja y que escribe, que analiza sobre la historia de las mujeres y obviamente que trabaja con perspectiva de género, donde dice que quienes quieran codificar los significados de las palabras librarían una batalla perdida porque las palabras, como las ideas a significar, tienen historia en una categoría útil eh, para el género, digamos, esta eh, escritora y historiadora estadounidense en mi eh, forma de lectura, eh, significó y por eso siempre acudo a esta frase, entiendo que, que las ideas, que las palabras nunca son en vano, y que nosotras las mujeres estamos eh, caminando a paso lento pero seguro, eh, trabajando sobre estas desigualdades de tantos años. Si ¿Sí podemos pasar a la otra placa. Bueno, eh, justamente como decía Hazel y Laura, eh, nosotros vamos a trabajar sobre las voces de las mujeres, estas mujeres que de alguna manera, a través de los cuerpos, de nuestros cuerpos, de corporizar esta palabra, eh, buscamos ponerle eh, una identidad, un posicionamiento, una idea. Entonces cuando hablamos de, de violencia de género, pensamos en algo que ya, quizás las que estamos aquí compartiendo este momento, eh, conocemos, pero me parecía como importante, para comenzar, eh, tener en cuenta que, qué es lo que la violencia de género infiere, ¿sí? Infiere visibilizar y denunciar el abuso de poder de estas masculinidades sobre las femineidades, Implica visibilizar y denunciar los derechos humanos arrasados. Esta autonomía, esta libertad, la vida, la identidad. Y por último, la ideología en la cual se sustenta el abuso de poder, al que nosotros llamamos patriarcado. Nos parecía como óptimo eh, trabajar este concepto de entender eh, cuando hablamos de privilegio, cuando hablamos de control, cuando hablamos de dominio, qué estamos infiriendo qué desencadena ese descontrol, en qué repercute y en cuántas formas de expresar la violencia, luego eh, esto determina, ¿sí? ¿Y qué impacto generan nosotras, las mujeres? La otra, por favor. Entonces, mmm, me voy a detener en analizar, o en pensar, o en compartir junto a ustedes, eh, ¿Qué hablamos cuando hablamos de grupos eh, psicosocioeducativos? Hablamos de grupos de asistencia a hombres que sufren violencia por razones de género. Aquí, en la situación de decidir en Moreno, tenemos desde hace 20 años 
estas grupalidades. Al comienzo del año 2000, significativamente, en nuestro país, en una situación social compleja, económica y cultural compleja, estos grupos fueron también espacios de reeducación, de interpretación y de trabajo en relación a sus ejercicios de abuso de poder. Lo mismo sucede con eh, la red de tipos de trabajo, como mencioné anteriormente, en masculinidades, RETEN, que es justamente una red que articula inclusive con otros expositivos en Latinoamérica y que, y que justamente eh, se compone de diferentes equipos que trabajamos en la temática de la asistencia de la violencia masculina. Tomamos algunos datos exploratorios, datos aproximados, en cuanto a información cuantitativa. Decimos que podemos ver cuántos dispositivos en nuestro país, con, contemplemos que nuestro país tiene 45 millones de habitantes, eh, y mmm, significativamente dentro de este, de este país, dentro de nuestro universo argentino, desde la década del 70, si bien se viene a hablar de las diferentes olas de los feminismos, sin embargo, para los trabajos con masculinidades podemos mencionar a partir aproximadamente del, de 1980, pero nunca hubo una estadística registrable desde que parten los diferentes objetivos. Había distintas disparidades diferentes puntos, eh, de las diferentes pro, de provincias o lugares eh, alejados. Esas grupalidades se componían eh, principalmente de ONGs, de espacios, de asociaciones civiles, de fundaciones, y algunas instituciones de salud, de hospitales, de comunidades, y con el tiempo hubo un crecimiento exponencial. Vimos que en 28 dispositivos grupales funcionaban 23 con tres esta investigación se realizó en la provincia de Buenos Aires, la exploración de esta información. <coughs> en ese momento, en el país, eh, existían aproximadamente 60 dispositivos grupales funcionando. Por supuesto que uno evalúa este crecimiento exponencial y también se interpreta cuál fue el motivo de este crecimiento exponencial, que da como resultado en este año 2020 de 35 dispositivos, esta información la proveyó el director de masculinidades de la provincia, que también hay aproximadamente 35 eh, dispositivos, 30 son ejercidos o acompañados por mujeres que coordinan o co-coordinan estos espacios, y hay aproximadamente 80 en todo el país. Bueno, nos parecía importante meternos o incluirnos o repensar eh, justamente en este proceso tan particular que eh, justamente en, esta, eh, en este año 2020 a nivel global atravesamos todos, la pandemia, el COVID-19, ¿qué nos pasaba en este proceso, en el ejercicio del rol, a, no, a nosotras las mujeres? ¿Sí? Eh, me pareció como eh, importante al menos tomar algunos mínimos registros en el primer cuatrimestre, estos datos que voy a compartir luego, tienen que ver con eh, información consultada eh, a la altura de agosto de nuestro 2020. Y contextualizar que eh, a las mujeres que se hicieron estas preguntas tenían que ver con el primer cuatrimestre del, eh, del atravesamiento de la cuarentena o del confinamiento eh, en el aislamiento social y preventivo obligatorio, ¿verdad? Si queremos ir pasando, este, aquí en esta placa que hablamos de los impactos, de los obstáculos, de las fortalezas y del rol profesional, nos parece importante, me parece eh, sumamente importante eh, visibilizar la tarea de las mujeres que acompañamos, facilitamos eh, estos espacios grupales en un contexto tan complejo como trabajar 
eh, con varones o hombres que ejercen violencia o que han ejercido violencia por razones de género en sus relaciones afectivas vinculares. Entonces, estos eran uno de los, eh, de los temas que partí como para eh, elaborar algunas preguntas. Pasamos a la otra, por favor. Me parecía eh, repensarnos en este porcentaje, ¿sí? Como dato cuantitativo. Eh, ¿Pudo desarrollar el abordaje profesional durante la cuarentena en Argentina, Buenos Aires? Lo aclaro porque nosotros nos componemos de muchas provincias, de muchos distintos distritos del país, y solamente se acotó a la población de la provincia de Buenos Aires con el nivel de información que uno tenía respecto de las mujeres que coordinaban en diferentes eh, eh, distritos, distritos, pueblos, barrios, para podernos, eh, digamos, entender. Y bueno, acá tenemos el resultado eh, de, del 100%, el 92% pudo, a través de diferentes métodos, realizar el abordaje profesional, de manera grupal, de manera remota, de manera virtual, a través de eh, los teléfonos, la telefonía celular, a través de consignas en el WhatsApp, o a través de llamadas eh, de manera individual, que son eh, los, las menos, eh, digamos, los menos eh, dispositivos que se trabajó de esa forma. También otra pregunta que nos, nos parecía como importante para poder después hacer toda una devolución sobre este abordaje cuantitativo y cualitativo, es si la virtualidad nos parecía a nosotras las mujeres una alternativa que llegó para quedarse, que llegó para instalarse, o si verdaderamente era un espacio eh, de tránsito solo por el momento en que eh, se tuviese que hacer este confinamiento al que estuvimos nosotros aquí en Argentina y en Buenos Aires durante ocho meses. Eh, y bueno, aquí ven los resultados. Un resultado relativo, ¿sí? Es decir, algunos no tenemos idea o tenemos si esto va a llegar, si esta alternativa va a quedar. Otros definitivamente pensaron que, que no, que es simplemente transitoriamente. Y algunos piensan que sí, algunas piensan que todavía es un espacio para continuar el, el abordaje. Con respecto al formato virtual, las mujeres, ¿cómo nos sentimos? ¿Qué nos pasó aquí en Argentina? Por eso soy repetitiva, el, la, el país y la provincia, porque también como supongo que ha pasado en las gran partes del mundo, a diferentes de cada distrito, eh, de menor población, de mayor población, más cosmopolita que otros, tuvieron distintos significados, distintas consecuencias. Eh, nosotros aquí en nuestro país justamente da cuenta de este resultado. ¿Cuántas sentimos? Eh, casi en un 50%, un 44%, sentimos creatividad a la hora de tener que pensar y posicionar una, una manera nueva, didáctica, de poder acompañar este proceso grupal que se transformó en virtual sin haberlo planificado. Un agotamiento que seguramente está suscitado también por ese tercer trabajo invisibilizado en los roles de las mujeres, que es el de la casa, el de los hábitos, el de la crianza, el del acompañar las otras tareas no reconocidas, que también tienen tanto peso cultural y económico y de tiempo como eh, la tarea que uno ejerce profesionalmente. Eh, la frustración un porcentaje menor da cuenta de sentirse frustrada, desanimada, con el criterio o con el recurso para poder eh, trabajar este formato que tenía que ver con el trabajo a través del WhatsApp. Mayoritariamente utilizó el recurso WhatsApp. Si podemos pasar. Si podemos pasar, por favor. Si podemos pasar. Otra pregunta que tenía que ver con el impacto en las políticas públicas, que a mí me parece sumamente importante, un eje trascendente, eh, este determina, esta determinación, si les parecía a ellas también eh, que el rol de las mujeres que coordinan grupos fortalece esta política de derechos humanos y en relación a la paridad de género, ¿verdad? 
eh, justamente eh, fue un planteo que se dudó, pero a la vez eh, tiene como consecuencia el pensar que justamente la lucha feminista, eh, las mujeres en la calle, aquí en Argentina en el 2015, a partir del de más conocido mundialmente Ni Una Menos, eh, generó un impacto evolutivo que marca eh, un, una bisagra en, en las causas. Por supuesto que con todo el peso que trae las mujeres, que desde, por poner un ejemplo, Simón de Bobar, las historiadoras, las filósofas, eh, aquí se, hablamos de otro tiempo, Cecilia Grierson, hace 1920, o sea, digamos, estamos hablando de muchas mujeres que impactaron en nuestra sociedad y generaron eh, una lucha que parecía invisibilizada. Así que este fortalecimiento en la política de derechos humanos y paridad de género arrolló este resultado, arrojó este resultado del 90%. Se preguntó también si, por qué considerábamos, ¿verdad?, eh, si el rol de las mujeres coordinadoras durante el COVID les parecía imprescindible. Hemos transitado, inclusive en el distrito en el que yo vivo, eh, aquí en Moreno, el tránsito de 10 femicidios, lamentable, una muy triste noticia, que nos permitió repensarnos, ¿no? Como se hablaba de la placa anterior. Eh, es imprescindible, somos eh, necesarias, somos necesarias porque ponemos voz, ponemos corporalidad sobre qué les pasa a estas mujeres acalladas, cooptadas por el poder y por la opresión. Entonces arrojó este resultado de 74%, excepcional el 9%, algunas le daban lo mismo la pregunta, algunas les parecía no innecesario, no importante, no tan necesario. Eh, pongo en contexto que este, esta encuesta fue facilitada, que ya era de manera voluntaria, eh, a la altura de agosto de, mil no, de, de 2020. ¿Pasamos por favor a la otra placa? Bueno, estas son algunas crónicas que me parecía eh, como importante compartirles, eh, qué, eh, digamos, respuestas, qué frases a veces se alojan o se, se transcriben de las participaciones de los varones en los diferentes grupos, nunca había aprendido a valorar al otro, el enojo es dolor, no soportaba nada del otro, hoy me doy cuenta de lo gran manipulador que fui, tiene que existir más grupos de estos, usé demasiadas ironías cuando controlo y ejerzo poder, hay marcas emocionales que están para toda la vida, no supe escuchar a mi pareja, el grupo nos ayuda a pensar y cambiar, los abrazos nos aflojan, el grupo me enseñó a demostrar mis sentimientos. Eh, se busca bajar el nivel de riesgo, se busca el reconocimiento de esos ejercicios, son propuestas, se propician el trabajo de los diferentes tipos de violencia, incluyendo la violencia digital en este marco tan del siglo XXI, pero que tanto el patriarcado utiliza como recurso para eh, infringir y continuar ejerciendo ese lugar de privilegio. La próxima, por favor. Y finalmente, eh, reflexionando acerca de esta tarea, eh, a mí me parece sumamente importante posicionar respecto de los coordinadores varones, esto, en esta lógica en donde desde naturalmente el varón que viene a un espacio a pasar por los diferentes procesos, la entrevista de admisión, lo que busca es al doctor, al señor, eh, al que seguramente como es varón me va a entender mejor que una mujer, me va a saber escuchar, a él le pasó lo mismo que a mí, entonces implica este posicionamiento como este doble juego de qué nos pasa a nosotros, qué nos acontece a las mujeres en relación a este posicionamiento en el rol profesional. Permite un reposicionamiento a los concurrentes, es decir, desde qué lugar estoy, no solamente estoy por ser mujer, sino también por ser mujer profesional, por ser una mujer que está utilizando un espacio de trabajo. Eh, presenta otros modelos femeninos, otros modelos de ser mujeres, eh, no convalidando los anteriores, ni mucho menos, ni desactualizando ninguno, ni generando o este, propiciando ninguna eh, subestimación a ninguno, simplemente es mostrar otro modelo de ser eh, femenino. 
esta necesidad de revalidar la categoría profesional, ¿no? De alguien que tiene, quien coordina tiene un título, puede que no lo tenga, pero sin embargo tiene un espacio de formación que hace a esta causa y que hace justamente a la tarea. Por supuesto que desde ya siempre uno sugiere que eh, en una temática tan compleja eh, tiene que tener una formación previa que, que permita que la tarea pueda ser pertinente al trabajo eh, este, para tal fin. Y el hecho de ser mujer y facilitadora de herramientas para bajar el nivel de riesgo entre tantos aspectos pone voz a las voces acalladas, oprimidas y cooptadas por esa desigualdad de poder. Es decir, creemos que hay que continuar visibilizando esta tarea, principalmente, visibilizando un espacio reeducativo, como en nuestro caso nos marca la ley 26.485, que propicia, digamos, la erradicación de la violencia hacia las mujeres, y que justamente en el, inciso, en el artículo 10, inciso 7, propicia este espacio de reeducación para varones que ejercen violencia. Las políticas públicas deberían tomar eh, más cartas sobre este asunto, formación como se está haciendo, y profundizar en esta articulación con las instancias de todo tipo, ya sea del área territorial, local, de salud, educativas y judiciales principalmente, que va a facilitar que estos espacios tengan eh, un, un lugar eh, importante pensando, trabajando en la reeducación del sentir, pensar y actuar de los varones en sus vínculos, como justamente pensando en las mujeres. Uno trabaja, somos mujeres que trabajamos con varones pensando en las mujeres. Eh, entiendo que los tiempos son son eh, tiranos, me parecía de alguna forma compartir qué nos pasó en este confinamiento, qué recursos se utilizaron, qué algunas líneas empezamos a trabajar e investigar acerca de qué nos pasa a las mujeres con este sentir, con este pensar, con este actuar, cómo nos atraviesa la coyuntura social, cultural, y cómo nos reposicionamos pensando en, en cómo seguimos, ¿no es cierto? Esta, esta situación de pandemia atraviesa el mundo, y el mundo está repensándose. Hoy por hoy estamos aquí interpelándonos, eh, intercambiando eh, formas de trabajar, intercambiando modelos de trabajo, y modelos de pensar en, en una vida más eh, libre de violencias, menos, eh, con menos inequidades, con menos desigualdades. Bueno, simplemente muchas gracias por la escucha y muchas gracias por la oportunidad de compartir junto a ustedes eh, bueno, la experiencia, el trabajo y las ganas de seguir compartiendo a través del mundo eh, lo que hacemos en distintos lugares. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. María Beatriz, we appreciate your presentation. <coughs> for all participants, uh, we will have time for... Muchas gracias. Claro, muchísimas gracias. We'll have time for Q&A, uh, but we'll continue to our next uh, presentation uh, from Rim Jim Jain. She's the actor, uh, director of uh, MITRA at the Center for Health and Social Justice, uh, having experience in communications, media, and the program development, Rim Jim is responsible for strategic planning, design, and implementation of programs related to working with men and boys on gender and masculinities uh, and the men's initiative for transforming relations through, relationships through action, uh, MITRA in India. Uh, she guides strategic direction, partnerships, and resource mobilization of the unit and leads a multidisciplinary team that is working on country-level programs uh, and campaigns like the Exoth National uh, Campaign, engaging men and boys in challenging gender discriminatory social norms. Uh, and she also builds on uh, CHSJ's foundation as a resource center on men and masculinities, engaging in knowledge building in the field and developing a community of practice for mainstreaming the work. Uh, thank you so much. And Rim Jim, we look forward to your presentation. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for that extensive introduction. And uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, for a very interesting presentation, I could see many similarities between the situation in our country 
and the South Asian region, as well as many differences in the way that you work and the way that we work. Uh, just a minute, I'll just turn on my presentation. Uh, Jennifer has already introduced me and in something about our work. Uh, I'm happy to be here to be having this session during the 16 days of activism uh, when so many of my colleagues are engaged in important awareness raising activities. Um, and uh, it's good that we are having this discussion uh, during this period. Mm. In this uh, presentation, I particularly want to explore the connections between uh, COVID masculinity and the increasing violence against women, children and minorities uh, that is in a way pulling apart our social fabric. Uh, is it that the management of COVID and this crisis situation is causing disturbance in some way in men's own self-concept and increasing the violence? Uh, yet I also want to ask is there a possibility that men can be engaged more positively? Uh, okay, so I'll just begin by going back to the months of April and May this year, uh, when the coronavirus led to a complete lockdown in India. All around, there was fear of the disease. Uh, there was the crisis of losing jobs and incomes. And in all this situation, unbelievably, there arose a yet worse situation this sudden increase in violence against women and children. Uh, what men and women have faced due to the COVID situation has been very clearly gendered as this slide shows. What I want to focus on is that this situation appears to be caused by uh, some sort of a reinforcement as well as a disruption of patriarchal role expectations. Uh, so how are men and masculinities implicated in a way in this? Uh, we feel there are pressures on men to fulfill their socially prescribed gender roles uh, as providers and protectors. They're expected to be tough. They're expected to be in charge, even though they are totally overwhelmed by COVID. Uh, it's uncertainty uh, as well as the state-based coercions also. Uh, yet, due to the pressure of social norms, uh, they're not allowed to express it. Uh, also, most men have never engaged in care work. Uh, they are not familiar with spending more time at home um, as they are forced to do nowadays during the lockdown, as well as even now when there is a situation of containment. They're not, in a way, allowed to share their own emotional crisis. Instead, uh, what they have learned is to manage their tensions through showing anger, through showing violence on others or on self, using their power to control, and it is being seen more as a justified response. Uh, now I want you to imagine for a moment a totally different scenario, one in which men are in new roles in the family and community. Uh, these images that you can see are all very recent. Uh, they are ones from our work, uh, which have come to us in different ways. Uh, men from the groups whom we mobilize on gender and masculinities have been taking responsibility for many domestic chores. They are already quite comfortable, for instance, with doing child care, cleaning utensils, washing clothes. Uh, one sees a significant impact of the involvement of men and boys in care and domestic work and how it improves relationships in the family. Uh, on the right side of the screen, uh, winnowing grain with his wife is the father of one of the men's group members uh, named Mukesh Kumar. Though not himself a group member or a Samanta Sathi as we term these men, uh, Samanta Sathi means partner in equality in Hindi. The father was influenced by the discussions uh, that his, uh, you know, the men's group uh, which his son was a part of. Uh, were having, and also by his son's changed behavior at home. Uh, in the earlier changes, we've seen that while working on violence with men from an intersectional rights-based perspective, uh, as husbands, they start to respect and consider their wives as partners, making decisions together as a couple and spending more time. Uh, this improved relationship also reduces sexual coercion in the marriage, 
and the women are able to express their own choice the wives uh, in their sexual relations too which is not very common normally uh, they extend support to women's leadership the men not only at home but also in the community uh, for example for women becoming entrepreneurs operating independent bank accounts uh, particularly in local vill village leadership forums uh, you know their participation uh, often the support that the men show can be in the form of taking over domestic responsibilities Uh, which frees up women to have opportunities uh, for uh, such kind of things outside the house and not placing restrictions on their mobility on doing things which are not within the traditional framework uh, during covid uh, community action alerts on social solidarity were developed by the men uh, by the men's groups uh, whom we were working with uh, they mapped vulnerable populations and families Uh, creating local support groups that are even now coordinating with authorities uh, uh, to ensure for instance availability of sanitary napkins during lockdown uh, which was a big issue there was no access even to an essential like this uh, for safe abortions of women um, and for pregnancy services so for instance the activity taking place in the picture of the group meeting uh, that is what they are doing they are having a conversation with uh, the authorities with the health authorities for making available services like this uh, so these are some pictures of audio stories that uh, we developed based on experiences from the field uh, uh, these audio stories have been going out widely in the communities people are listening to them we've been getting feedback on them uh, as the pandemic progressed we saw that the men who had changed towards their wives um, and their families at home uh, they began maintaining a sort of vigilance against domestic violence during covid in their own communities uh, they took on local responsibilities uh, they coordinated with the authorities instead of being just passive recipients uh, they took an active role in their communities and gradually as uh, social divisions started arising and started becoming worse uh, over the past few months since march onwards uh, they put into place community protocols uh, for reaching the most vulnerable people which uh, according to us is fairly unusual uh, that has not been the mainstream response uh, that we have heard of in other places uh having been mobilized uh, having been mobilized to address violence against women uh, it seems as though uh, these men are in some way drawing on their understanding of power hierarchies and putting into place a form of non hegemonic leadership uh, most of these men are in fact not those who are uh, you know very entitled in other ways socio economically they live on the margins themselves and uh, they have themselves been hit very hard economically and socially because of this crisis and yet uh, they have showed a sense of resilience uh, they've taken ownership for the community to respond in a humane and equitable manner uh, they have for instance been taking up issues of returning migrants uh, which is a very big issue in india Uh, many of them belong to socially weaker groups uh, these migrants who are often discriminated against they are ill treated they are deprived of job cards under the national employment guarantee scheme manrega uh, so this is some data that has been put together by um, my colleague shriti and our team of researchers and i want to share with you a slice of this larger data that we have actually from states around the country um, i'm focusing only on data that came um, from three states out of the seven or 10 that we are working in and uh, these three states are uttar pradesh madhya pradesh and uttarakhand and uh, this is data which came in uh, from the three months of july to september this year these are responses and actions which were taken in communities uh, where about 2000 of these uh, samanta sathis who are the men's group members that i mentioned 
have been working actively since the pandemic started uh, in this campaign called Ek Saath, which means together in Hindi. Uh, the campaign aims to particularly involve men and boys in challenging discriminatory social norms. Uh, these are men with whom the focus of interaction so far had been on their self accountability for gender equality through self change um, and in their homes and families supporting women's autonomy. Now linked with grassroots organizations working on women's rights um, and for social justice for weaker groups, uh, these men also started taking a wide variety of public actions. Uh, meeting, as you can see, a range of key community stakeholders. Uh, so as this slide shows, the issues being taken up are those that affect women, affect migrants who are often the most discriminated against, the most vulnerable, uh, the weakest and the most voiceless, and various other disadvantaged groups. Uh, for example, denial of Manrega job cards to returned migrants uh, is something that uh, is regularly being addressed as per our data. Uh, this equal pay to women in Manrega is another important issue. Uh, uh, food security uh, for everyone, violence against women. Uh, these are some of the issues, as you can see, which have been raised. Uh, we also uh, found that whereas in the first uh, three COVID months uh, of April, May and June, the focus was on providing immediate relief and rations, uh, safety kits and information on prevention. Uh, subsequently, these men started taking up in a big way issues that often challenged existing social norms and particularly men's involvement in such issues such as menstrual health needs and provision of safe abortion services uh, from a health system whose priorities were very clearly elsewhere. Um, you know, there was more of a focus on uh, managing the epidemic as a health emergency. Uh, so this is the data that uh, we have on the specific cases of rights violations that uh, these group of men that I was talking to you about in these three states have taken up in the past three months uh, through the EXAT COVID gender hubs. Uh, in a way, uh, they have spread further the influence of actions by individual Samantha Sathi in his village or community uh, because the gender hubs are now convening both government and non-government stakeholders to take coordinated action uh, throughout the di entire district now. Uh, for ensuring rights of women and other groups during the pandemic and uh, the recovery process. Uh, so finally, I want to ask, uh, or I want to share rather, uh, how do masculinities change uh, from the option one to this option two? Uh, in our work, we see the importance of providing a platform for men to examine their own power, privilege, their beliefs and behaviors. Uh, we see this leads to a greater concern for women's needs, um, a respect for their choices. Uh, uh, you know, the first changes that happen is contribution to domestic work and childcare. Uh, and ultimately, it, uh, you know, there is a complete transition from control of women uh, to acceptance and celebration of their achievements. Uh, rather than resisting it or putting up barriers to women's empowerment. Uh, there is also increasing relationship in this process among men themselves, um, where they are supporting and counseling each other, and in a way holding each other accountable also for changes, uh, for these gender equitable changes. Uh, then comes this process of taking public actions, reaching out to those who are in greater distress, uh, checking if public support systems are working, interacting with local bodies like uh, local governance bodies that we have in India, like panchayat systems, uh, holding them accountable for action on violence cases and other essential services. Uh, importantly, what happens uh, is that the men start acknowledging at some level that, uh, you know, they, uh, they start acknowledging their violent behavior uh, which is a change normally from previous denial. 
um, there is a realization also how aggression and violence uh, damages themselves as well as others and that it cannot be the way to solve a problem and that actually violence increases the problem uh, they then start speaking to others spreading the message that it will not be tolerated a uh, men's groups take collective action with other groups uh, to reach out to survivors they refer for services uh, community monitoring is also one of the ways that then leads to reducing the incidence of violence and discrimination and uh, through community action it helps to set new gender norms and more equitable gender norms thank you for this uh, for allowing me the <laughs> thank you maria uh, uh, with this i'll hand over to ranging. thank you so much uh, with this i'd like to hand over to ranjini murthy uh, she's an independent researcher who has also evaluated our projects uh for instance she's um uh, she's evaluated our project in jharkhand uh, the father care project where uh, we worked with men uh, to develop new models of child care and uh, for men to support uh, women as uh, partners uh so ranjini is right now in a city which has been hit by a cyclone a typhoon so uh i'm glad that she's able to come on and thank you and over to you ranjini yeah okay um i'm going to speak uh, thanks rimjim for this opportunity to engage here i'm going to speak on masculinities and community resilience to co and i'm going to kind of reflect upon rimjim's presentation from a feminist lens so the objectives of my presentation are twofold to understand what is a feminist lens to working with men and boys and secondly to reflect on see uh, rimjim's i mean their organization center for health and social justice efforts from a feminist lens now uh i just want to say working with men and boys is not same as working on masculinities for example you could have agriculture extension with men which is really not masculinities but about increasing agriculture productivity um or education support to poor boys so what so uh so what is working on masculinities uh this experience of chs day suggests that it is about challenging dominant construction of power privilege and roles associated with being men and boys for example gender based violence they have been working with men to address gender based violence which is about power and uh, privilege and the roles are help you know encouraging men to help their wives in housework help their partners in housework or about a you know a, a older sibling a male sibling preventing child marriage early marriage of the sister so masculinity is about challenging power fundamentally and roles to also is falls under the ambit but power is much more than just changing helping assisting it is more about structural issues like supporting abortion by their partner or violence against women now so what is a feminist lens hmm? feminist lens um you know focuses on gender transformation and men and boys needs both so when we say gender transformation this side it is about addressing say violence against women issues of as we have already said abortion issues of uh, uh, what uh, early child marriage uh, issues of girl child sexual abuse all that comes under gender transformation at the same time 
it is also about addressing men's boys needs like boys are not supposed to cry in public from a young age they are taught that if they are short then they are you know are uh, not acceptable uh the other is can this click uh, chst can you admit because i'm not able to see yeah it is about partnership and not benevolence uh, i want to say that it is not about men doing things for women alone it is about you know helping women to stand on their own legs hmm? like this women having her own bank passbook operating it is not about men going working and giving the money to their some bit of the money to their partners no so it is something like partnership and not benevolence the third which i would say what is working with men and boys from a feminist lens is a uh, breaking hierarchy yeah so we need to ask what is hierarchy hierarchy is you know uh, multiple structures it could be patriarchy capitalism it could be caste in the indian context it could be uh, ethnicity so various hierarchies coming together so breaking that for example here uh, you know is that being broken for example sometimes um, you know uh, what happening with child marriage but not in say breaking inter caste or inter religious marriage once it comes to inter religious marriage there is a backlash even some hesitate so in a perfect working with masculinity is changing all hierarchies not just with regard to patriarchy ha huh? here the boys and girls together are working on something so here is the resistance to in india about inter caste inter religious marriages and honor killings which are happening the fourth is challenging relational construction how do we move the discourse you know a feminist perspective to masculinity is moving from say father to parent not construction of father mother to construction as parent from wife to partner so how do we you know then there is a kind of shift in thinking and construction so do we do that or do we say how do you be responsible husbands or do we say how how will you be responsible parents and partner so these are shifts which we need to make the a fifth aspect of a feminist perspective to masculinity you know are women and men coming together to strengthen accountability to gender equality or are just men groups doing it for women so this is something very important to us so you know in this example which i've shown there was a joint assessment of gender needs and interests and planning for the future a citizens charter was evolved of what are the needs with regard to it was both concerning basic needs like rations uh, which is a food distribution system and violence against women sixth is working on non violent ways of resolving conflict yeah so there is a need to work with men on this uh you know unlike a more developed economically developed country or even human development a lot of violence is also linked to alcoholism and substance abuse yeah so how do you work with men and boys around this this is also a non violent ways of working and resolving conflict now what i'm going to do is reflect on rimjim's presentation from this perspective what was the strength of chsj intervention on masculinities post covid from a feminist lens on the positive side um we saw men and women's group together planning what needs to be done yeah they came together to plan post covid what are the needs hmm? uh what are the relief needs what are the protection needs in terms of violence against women girl child marriage sexual abuse etc 
It is also about, uh, so they also worked, so it was not benevolent. Yeah, it was more rights based. And, you know, it was also, you know, during COVID time, the men sharing, helping women in housework and addressing women's practical needs, be it sanitary towels, etc., going and getting. The third, which we saw, men and boys preventing a girl college. Uh, I think it was written in one of those phone uh, podcast kind of thing, which may not have been visible to you, you know, and addressing domestic violence and addressing strategic gender interest of women. You know, like saying safe abortion during this time is not an easy task. While it is legal in India, abortion on many grounds, not on all grounds, but on many grounds, it's not easily available. There's a lot of stigma. It uh, you know, addressed men's vulnerability. Rinjam didn't present this, but it was there in her slide of uh, male suicide, not being able to earn a living. There is a lot of pressure on men. And one of the you know podcast or whatever it is was on preventing them from committing suicide. So that kind of uh, work is also was in keeping with feminist lens uh, engaging men in relief work spreading awareness on COVID-19 so we see that the a uh, lot of the work which CHSJ has been doing is not working with uh, you know men for other purpose like agriculture or you know uh, keeping people safe during COVID that has been one part of it but it has gone beyond to a feminist lens. So areas of, for reflection, how to avoid this male benevolence, protectiveness, when we work with men and boys on, uh, you know, uh, during COVID times. It's very easy for men to say, we will protect our women, I, we will protect our sisters. So how do we avoid that? That is one of the challenge. Um, you know, need for men and women to address gender social issues affecting women holistically. Um, uh, you know, there were um, uh, what? You know, there's things which are like uh, delays in health seeking by women, you know, with COVID hmm? or giving them attention. Um, that is there for both women and men out of matches more. Hmm? Because men are considered all, uh, you know, um, what uh, heroes like your football player. So you know they don't they don't go on time. So need to address those kind of uh, things. Need for addressing high risk behavior because men come here at least in India with a higher incidence of, uh, you know, high blood pressure. Uh, you know, and many health and uh, smoking, which increase vulnerability to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to audit men and boys together. How is the government performing? Uh, say, what to do this, this, this during COVID-19? Are they really doing it? What are the gender-specific aspects they're doing? Not doing. So uh, I think a lot has been done already and there is a need to go forward in uh, working with men and boys around COVID-19. CHSD has shown the pathway and, you know, it is possible to build on it. Um, but, uh, you know, drawing a bit on the Argentinian example, I really like the work with perpetrators. Uh, so that was to me uh, quite challenging, but your scenario of being able to, you know, people able to be able to work from home, you know, and uh, uh, seek employment is very different from India because the internet connectivity is still low and people do not have a smart, not all people, very few have a smartphone and uh, laptop, etc. So the contexts are different, but many ways the lessons are similar. Uh, so to sum up, I just want to say, if we want gender socially equitable outcomes, 
we need to understand pre-existing chiriarchy. That is a section of migrants back. The migrants tend to be quite poor and vulnerable. Uh, so the men welcome them with some flowers. I thought that is a very, very nice uh, gesture. So, and, you know, it will always be the case that information in India reaches the Dalit or the untouchable community last. So how do we deal with those kind of things? So number two is we uh, need to understand uh, the gendered impact of COVID-19. In and biological impact, both. Where men are vulnerable, where women are more vulnerable. And uh, I think that analysis is very important. As and uh, I think that is where the challenge is. Huh? Where we slip into benevolence, how do we go beyond into a real feminist intervention around masculinities? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranjani. Thank you. That was a wonderful, wonderful feminist evaluation Thank of Thank our you very work. Much. So one of the things which I wanted to raise, Ranjani uh, and Maria also, is that uh, uh, often what happens is in situations like this, uh, it's uh, men are more inclined in any case to take up uh, public actions and to uh, ask for accountability from authorities for, for instance, uh, services and other things. Uh, but where it is really effective or what I feel the difference over here is that at the same time, men have also done a process of gone through a process of self accountability where inside the homes also they have realized the importance of shared space. And uh, in some way, this is what they are trying to duplicate uh, in the public space uh, through these whole, this, uh, you know, sort of COVID gender hub um, and the details which I just shared. Uh, so do you think, uh, so this is a question to you, Ranjani, that do you think that this is a process, this journey uh, has been made possible because of the kind of uh, understanding of uh, power, power hi hierarchies, um, and you know, there's a sense of empathy, uh, a sense of understanding that you know one needs to create space and not dominate all the space, uh, which leads to this sense of social solidarity and ultimately uh, resilience in communities during a crisis like COVID. Jim, I um, totally am with you that uh, first personal is political. Mm -hmm. Bringing change in the within the family, in um, how you know as a partner, as a parent, as a sibling, um, that is the first fundamental change in attitude is required for that. And once that happens it is more easy to work at the community level with a similar feminist perspective. So I, I, I think the way from, uh, you know, uh, making the personal political to going to the community level uh, and bringing in the same feminist sense, I think that is very, very important. And uh, I think the way that is one of the effective uh, strategies which you have adopted, which CHSJ has adopted. Maria, you want to say something? Sí, primero, nada, eh, la verdad que muy interesantes eh, las, las dos posturas. Eh, quería responder que en el chat no podía a Ranchani, que también en Argentina hay mucha desigualdad en términos inclusive de las eh, comunicaciones y la internet, lo que, eh, lo que estaba exponiendo es que el recurso que se utilizó fue la línea telefónica WhatsApp, la mayoría no tiene smartphones, y hubo en algunas situaciones donde se tuvo que hacer el llamado común, 
porque justamente no cuentan con el recurso, pero predominantemente el recurso utilizado fue el teléfono común y la línea WhatsApp, digamos. Esto como para poder eh, también dar cuenta o ampliar que no todo el mundo tiene un recurso de, de, de otro nivel donde se podía hacer ni videollamada, ni Zoom, ni mucho menos. Eso también me parecía como, como un aporte. Y me parece también transversalizar los ejes por los que los tres eh, pudimos compartir esta cuestión del privilegio, del patriarcado, y la importancia de poner sobre el tapete, sobre el debate, o poner en tensión eh, las voces y los, los cuerpos, ¿no es cierto? Es decir, cómo se van corporizando las palabras en, en este lugar de, de no de cohabitar, en el caso que decía Rimshin, eh, y también en el espacio en donde no te ayudo, si no soy parte de ese espacio, por lo tanto, eh, ese espacio también es mío, soy responsable, entonces no estoy colaborando con, sino también soy parte del lugar, lo cohabito, ¿no? Um, I just want to raise a very important uh, point, that not everybody has the space or ability or time to come to group spaces. This may include people who are sick, who are elderly, huh? and with differential ability, etc. So I think, uh, you know, uh, so the working at the individual family level and intra-household relationships becomes very important to be supplemented by the group spaces. But as you're saying, the group space cannot take over individual space or, I mean, family space or the family space can take over the community space. And I think when we say family, as in 10 to 20 years from now in India, we have to think families not only central, but it may be, you know, diverse. Huh? With regard to it could be, you know, people uh, with uh, two people of the same sex staying together with a different sexual orientation. So we need to also think of families in a diverse way in the coming years, if not now itself in um, urban areas. But you have raised a very, and they may not be accepted by the group. Yeah. So that is something um, um, which is uh, very important to think about. Uh, when we talk about uh, private and uh, are we making it binary or going beyond is a question which is also very important to raise. Yeah, that was so important, Ranjani. Thank you for giving that clarification also. Uh, when Maria was giving her presentation and talking about her experiences, uh, what struck me particularly was the difference uh, between the way that uh, she and her organization approaches the work with men at some level, the methodological difference, and ours, because um, uh, we find uh, that, uh, you know, we kind of feel that it's uh, very important for men to speak to men, uh, at least in the beginning, uh, for that space of conversation and, uh, you know, for men uh, to open up about their uh, fears, which may be their gender fears, that uh, women are becoming stronger than them, about their vulnerabilities, whereas they are not able to do that with uh, women facilitators or coordinators. Uh, that has been our experience. So I find the way that uh, Maria has been speaking about women coordinators and the fact that, in fact, they're now thinking of bringing in male coordinators, but they are not there so far. Uh, what sort of challenges do you face? I mean, uh, how do you face the challenges that we normally face in such a situation, Maria? Eh, nosotros, lo que por ahí, para también este, responderte, es pensar... Eh, o sea, el eje de trabajo cuando uno lo planteaba el dispositivo grupal funciona para que los varones, los hombres también eh, se interpelen socialicen, justamente uno apunta a trabajar la socialización masculina, es decir esta cuestión de poder compartir con otros hombres, qué les pasa a ellos, qué sienten, qué les pasa en sus emociones, sus subjetividades 
porque justamente en, en cuanto se empiecen a modificar su subjetividad, será tal vez un hombre que ha o bajado el riesgo, o se ha interpelado, o ha repensado. Ahora, respecto a tu pregunta sobre la infancia de mujeres, en mi caso, eh, me interesa potenciar o hacer visible este lugar, que no sea un lugar, digamos, eh, simplemente de, de sumisión, que sea un lugar que no es porque tenga poder, sino porque pueda acompañar este lugar, y justamente con esta contradicción o con este con esta dualidad, ¿no es cierto? Somos las mujeres que además corporizamos un espacio y acompañamos un espacio, le damos una sinergia distinta, rupturamos, a mí me gusta jugar mucho con este término, el rupturar, rupturar una estructura que sigue siendo estas cofradías masculinas, como mencionaba la antropóloga Rita Segato, ¿no es cierto? En estas alianzas que plantean los varones. El hecho de la incorporación de la mujer en estos espacios más masculinizados, si se quiere, eh, ruptura, eh, modela, enfoca, obviamente, como decía Ranjani, esta perspectiva de género amplía y justamente eh, potencia esta lucha por la igualdad, ¿verdad? Ahora, no estamos subestimando el rol de los varones, eh, no estamos planteando que no estén los varones, lo que yo planteo es que se haga visible la tarea nuestra, que se haga visible que se digamos, que se potencie este lugar, el que muchas veces, como dije anteriormente, eh, se le asigna o fue asignado naturalmente el lugar del saber al varón, y la mujer secunda. Entonces, en estos posicionamientos, estos corrimientos, facilitan, aceitan otras prácticas, otras prácticas de hacer eh, procesos, no lo llamo tratamientos, pero sí procesos. Entonces, estas prácticas, eh, se trasladan a su cotidianidad, a sus relaciones. Es una mujer hablando con un varón, hablando de sexualidad en la masculinidad, hablando de las eh, diversidades sexuales, hablando de los ejercicios de privilegios, de abuso de poder, de control. Entonces es una mujer que pone voz también, que acompaña ese proceso. Ay, yo quería preguntarle, porque me pareció encantador el término, ¿qué, eh, qué triarcado? si podía explicarlo eh, o ampliar ese término que me pareció eh, interesante, uno aprende siempre. Uh, María, uh, firstly, I want to just um, respond to uh, in this thing of we always engage, just like we need to challenge dominant masculinities, we also need to challenge dominant femininities. Um, You know, so what sometimes uh, what I mean to say is women are both survivors of violence, but they, some are also perpetuators. So they hold dominant masculinities too. So bringing men and women in these collective spaces challenges these dominant masculinities in both helps. The feminist among the women and the men can come together and help others reflect. So I think we need to move beyond this victim mode all the time. Um, coming to the uh, your question of what is kairiarchy, um, actually there's a web definition, but it is intersecting hi hierarchies. Because this term really came about uh, because, uh, you know, Women are oppressed not only by patriarchy, but other hierarchies too, be it with regard to India like caste identity or with regard to sexual orientation or gender identity. So there are many things which come together or economic status, we call it caste in India. So race. So we cannot look at only patriarchy as a reason. A uh, Dalit woman in uh, uh, in uh, India would be, you know, vulnerable to violence by the upper caste employer. Yeah. So there, there's a mixture of gender and caste coming in. So unless we look at these multiple hierarchies and identities. You know, these hierarchies of structures lead to intersectionality with Rim Jim was talking about. Intersectional relations is created by intersectional structures. 
So that is what this term is about. And I can cut and paste the definition of uh, hierarchy or send it to you, you know, uh, separately. So it's there on the web. You can see it. And there was a sí, seminar on institutions around that. Y Rinshim quería consultarte sobre los cuentos, que me pareció una estrategia didáctica sumamente creativa. Si puedes compartir los cuentos eh, por WhatsApp o audio, no, no sé cómo es la estructura. Uh, yes, uh, Maria, I would definitely love to do it. The only thing is that the stories are in Hindi because uh, that is the primary language of communication um, among many of our groups. So um, I don't know how much uh, it would be of how much use, uh, but in any case, uh, what I would suggest is that this is a tool which is particularly powerful So, uh, you know, it's not just our stories. I would say anybody who's working with men or communities can develop their own similar tool like this. Um, in the beginning, as soon as the lockdown began, and at that time, nobody was allowed outside at all. Uh, there was such a huge sense of despair um, total confusion, there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so many of our male facilitators were saying that the kind of uh, responses or reactions that they were getting from uh, men was that, uh, you know, these things of utter despair, where the men sometimes felt like committing suicide, they would have these suicidal thoughts and share with them. Uh, Of course, this entire thing of a lot of violence started arising in the community. Uh, so the one way which we thought we could immediately get to people since we were not physically able to be present and listening to all these stories and some of them were very inspiring. In fact, how people had done interventions. Uh, so they were all put together and uh, sometimes they were recorded on the mobile phone. Um, you know, by my colleague Jagdish uh, uh, from his home itself and then he put them out. And uh, uh, so these stories have been small ways, in fact, of uh, giving hope to people, uh, helping them to listen to their own stories, each other's stories in the community. There were things which they were able to immediately identify with that particular local situation which had happened, uh, even the names of people, uh, the way that the entire drama was put together. Uh, it was largely disseminated via WhatsApp. So um, I think they've had a very significant role to play in their own way. And uh, it's a tool which anybody can develop anywhere in their own local contexts. Because uh, ultimately, the stories which are most powerful are those which Uh, immediately have a connect with us uh, because we can identify ourselves with that situation, with those people. And these are really, really local stories. So that's what I wanted to share about them. Muchas gracias. Uh, one of the other things, uh, Maria, if I may bring it up here, uh, it's almost time to end, I think. Uh, but I think it's relevant because this is something which has just happened. The fact that one of the greatest footballers of all time, Diego Maradona, has passed away. And uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, he was from Argentina. Uh, how, uh, how do you think his, um, his legacy and what he represents, uh, what does it mean to an understanding of masculinities in your country and uh, influence on men in a way. Creo que primero es muy reciente, estamos en proceso todavía de, de este acompañamiento desde el lugar, como dijimos ante, antes de, de empezar la charla, eh, voy a hablar, me parece, por una cuestión lógica del jugador, pero desde esa lógica del jugador, creo que este jugador se metió en la piel 
de un trabajador, de una persona que nació en una villa, una villa para nosotros es un, un espacio bastante humilde, que como dijo él un comentario una vez de la villa a París, eh, es poner en ese peso del crecimiento, del poder, del liderazgo, de, de lo social, de lo masculino colectivo, de esta construcción. Eh, esto abre, abre un montón de líneas de debates, como te dije anteriormente, entre lo público y lo privado, me voy a referir a lo público, lo público me parece que tiene que ver con esta cuestión de también de este, de este amor, de, este, de, este, de esta pasión, ¿no es cierto?, de esta lucha, de este sostenimiento de ciertas ideas, y de lo genuino, inclusive hasta de su liderazgo, para lo bueno y para lo malo. Y eso es lo que creo que en, la, en el mundo, en lo social, impactó eh, en la humanidad. Hoy el mundo también está llorando el jugador. Y en la masculinidad creo que tiene que ver con, con esta cuestión de esta construcción que que justamente también tiene su otro costado disruptivo, porque también esta masculinidad está empezando a través de distintas maneras, en algunos aspectos a deconstruir, entonces genera ruidos, genera una mirada en algunos casos más distantes, y esto, este, esta conjunción de choques, esta conjunción de contradicciones, esta dualidad de lo positivo y lo negativo, de la pasión, del odio y del amor, es lo que genera esta esencia de lo humano, ¿verdad? Del error y del acierto. Eh, y, y en esta construcción lógica de este crecimiento que ha tenido, eh, y inclusive, eh, fundamentalmente en el caso de Argentina, por lo popular que es el fútbol, también esta cuestión de desde dónde llegó. Fue alguien que creció desde su eh, habilidad natural. Entonces, desde esa lógica... Eh, se entiende como este lugar de por qué tiene tanta popularidad. Las calles a la noche estuvieron colmadas, y en el mundo también estuvieron colmadas, en distintas partes, ¿no? Esto tiene que ver también con esta cuestión muy propia de nuestras características como latinos. Yo right, particular... right. Eh, particularmente entiendo que estamos llegando al final... Este, quería agradecer la oportunidad de este encuentro, ojalá que tengamos más encuentros a las organizadoras, las traductoras, las intérpretes y nuestras compañeras acá en el panel, a Rinjin y a Rangini, que hemos podido compartir un, una información, una experiencia, un recorrido, visiones, visiones que nos unen en lo que, te, en lo que tiene que ver con la interseccionalidad, con todavía las inequidades, por qué seguir luchando, con las realidades culturales y sociales que atravesamos, cada una en un sitio tan de latitudes tan diferentes, pero que tenemos algo en común y que tiene que ver con eh, la deconstrucción en la masculinidad, y poniendo foco inclusive en el confinamiento, ¿no? Las tres hemos puesto la mirada en qué nos atravesó eh, en este COVID-19, y por supuesto que sí. Nacimos una cultura machista. Yes, thank you so much, Maria. You've said it all. Uh, I'll just add my thanks to uh, all that you've already said. And uh, as Ranjani says, we also share a similar machismo culture uh, as the Latin Americans. And um, I think we find everywhere that uh, the youth and young men are very powerfully influenced by public figures. Uh, those, they may be actors, they may be sports persons. Uh, so it's very important to see what kind of a masculinity they represent and the impact it has not just on men, but on women and girls also, and on society as a whole. So thank you so much for this, each and every one. Uh, it's over from me. Thank you so much. It was great learning across regions. And uh, thanks for the questions raised. Um, together we march on the path towards greater equality. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much too. And all those who interpreted and Rimjim, thank you. Thank you so much colleagues. Wonderful session, much appreciated. Thank you to our interpreters. Yeah, thanks to the interpreters and Jennifer. Muchas gracias. And the organizers. Bye Maria. 
Muchas gracias, gracias, Jenny, Laura. Eh, chao, hasta luego, gracias. Un placer, muchísimas gracias. Adiós. Goodbye.